Hi everybody, this is part two of the lecture to accompany chapter two in your textbook. Please carefully read chapter two as I don't have time to discuss everything in it. Okay, let's continue with chapter two. I just want to make sure you understand what is and is not an argument before we proceed. As I've said before, the word argument as we use it in this class does not refer to disagreements or heated exchanges. Formal argument is different. Pictures, movies, and other art forms are not in and of themselves arguments. They do play on our emotions, though, and emotional appeal can be persuasive and cause us to form opinions and beliefs. But because they can't be labeled valid or invalid or weak or strong in the same sense as a formal argument, they don't qualify. If-then statements are sometimes mistaken for arguments, but they are not. They are claims in and of themselves. They are single claims, even though they have two parts. They can certainly be used as the premise of a deductive argument, and you can see by this example that they can function as evidence in an argument. Here's the example. Premise one, if John is not in the house, then he went to the movies. Premise two, he is not in the house. So, conclusion, he went to the movies. Sometimes you see a paragraph full of information, but no obvious conclusion. The information may be helpful and may even inspire you to do something, but if there's no indication that the speaker or writer is asking you to think or do something, then it's not an argument. Here's a hint. Reminders or commands to do something are not arguments. So don't forget to turn your clocks back or pick your toys up off the floor right now are not arguments. A because B or X because Y are tricky. You have to look at the entire sentence or paragraph to determine whether it is actually an argument or an explanation. If what follows the word because is a reason for accepting what came before because, then it's an argument. If it's an explanation of the cause, then it's not an argument. The sentence, Mike is in his swimsuit because he was swimming, is an explanation of what caused Mike to be in his swimsuit. The sentence, Mike was swimming because he is in his swimsuit, is an argument. He is in his swimsuit is evidence that supports the conclusion that he was swimming. Now that we know what is and isn't an argument, let's look for a moment at persuasion. Our ideas about how people are persuaded haven't changed much in 24 centuries, ever since the Greek philosopher Aristotle wrote his treatise called The Rhetoric. In it, he says that people are persuaded in three ways. First, they are persuaded by ethos, or the credibility and characteristics of whoever is attempting to persuade them. People pay more attention and are more likely to believe what a person says who seems, to them anyway, to be credible due to their background, reputation, their accomplishments, and maybe even their charisma. Second, people are persuaded by pathos or emotional appeal. If you can get someone to feel something about what you're talking about, they're more likely to believe you. So if you make people feel angry about something that you feel is wrong in our society, maybe you can convince them to do something about it. The final way that people are persuaded is by logos or logic and reasoning, which is exactly what you're in this class to study. Sadly, this mode is the least effective way to persuade people. Advertising doesn't use it much. Politicians certainly don't either. We like to think we have logical reasons for thinking and doing things, but mostly we don't. As I said before, humans are big walking blobs of emotion who occasionally have a rational thought. However, when we try to persuade others, we often try to use argument, so we need to know how to do it correctly. And for those of you who are journalism students, it's extremely important for you to know how to use critical reasoning when writing and editing in order to be an ethical journalist. Being a fourth estate gatekeeper is a big responsibility, and you don't want to abuse it. But all of us need to be aware of the ways that ethos, pathos, and logos influence and affect our thoughts and actions. It's crucial that we learn to understand arguments, so we need ways to evaluate them. Unfortunately, it can be very hard to do that. Even though I teach this class, I can still get bogged down trying to understand someone else's argument. And if you can't understand it, it's difficult to respond to it rationally. Why are some arguments so hard to understand? 
Well, often it's because they go by very quickly. Someone might speak so fast in the heat of the moment that you're not quite sure what they said. Other times it's because they're long and complicated and almost impossible to follow. Or someone sneaks in an argument in the middle of a bunch of other non-argumentative material and you don't even recognize it as an argument. And often someone is obviously putting an argument forward, but it's such a bad, poorly formed, weak or invalid argument that it makes no sense and that makes it difficult to respond to. In spite of all this, it's possible to start to look at arguments in a way that helps you to see their construction and be able to evaluate the evidence for the conclusion rationally and determine if indeed this is an argument worth listening to. Three steps can help you do this. First, find the conclusion of the argument. Second, identify the premises and figure out what kind of reasoning is being used. Third, and this is best for shorter arguments, Diagram them so you can clearly see how the argument is structured. Let's look at each of these steps. The first thing you need to do when looking at any argument is to determine the conclusion. Now, there are two ways to do that. First, look and see if there are any telltale indicator words that let you know that a phrase or a sentence is obviously the conclusion. Therefore is a pretty common one, but there are others like thus, so, it follows that, and so on. If you familiarize yourself with these indicator words, you should have no trouble determining the conclusion, as in this example. Jones won't plead guilty to a misdemeanor, and if he won't plead guilty, then he'll be tried on a felony charge. Therefore, he will be tried on a felony charge. Obviously, therefore, he will be tried on a felony charge is the conclusion. There may not be any indicator words. Many arguments don't use them. In that case, you'll need to look for the statement in the argument that seems to sum up the idea that the author or speaker is trying to get across. Look at each statement and ask yourself, is this evidence for something? Then that's a premise, not a conclusion. Or is this the thing that the evidence is proving or supporting? When you find that, you'll find the conclusion. This example shows that. North Korea is a great threat to its neighbors. It has a million-person army ready to be unleashed at a moment's notice, and it also has nuclear weapons. So you can see that the million-person army ready to be unleashed and the nuclear weapons are evidence that North Korea is a great threat. Once you've identified the conclusion, then you need to look for all the evidence or reasons given to accept the conclusion and identify them. Then you need to number every part of the argument consecutively as it appears. Look at these examples. In the first one, the first claim is a premise that Jones won't plead guilty to a misdemeanor. The second claim is an if-then premise. If he won't plead guilty, then he will be tried on a felony charge. The third claim is the conclusion that therefore he will be tried on a felony charge. Because the argument is set up in such a way that the conclusion is the only possible conclusion you can come to based on the premises, this is a deductive argument. In the second example, The first claim is the conclusion that North Korea is a great threat to its neighbors. Claim two is a premise that it is a million-person army ready to be unleashed at a moment's notice. And claim three is a premise that it also has nuclear weapons. This argument is inductive because the reasons are support for the conclusion but not irrefutable proof. It is, however, a fairly strong inductive argument. As you can see, Sometimes one sentence will have more than one claim in it. So you look for words like and, plus, or additionally. Now, for shorter arguments like this, you need to take those numbers and use them to illustrate the structure of the argument using a diagram. The book goes into a bit more detail on this topic, but I'm going to keep it simple. In this particular argument, you need the information in both 1 and 2 to come up with the conclusion 3. So it would look like this, one plus two with a line underneath it and an arrow leading down to three. And here's a diagram of the other argument. Even though the conclusion is the first thing in the argument, it needs to be at the bottom of the diagram because you're showing how the evidence leads to the conclusion. So two and three are above it with arrows from each leading down to one. Why don't you have to put two plus three Well, because each premise by itself can support the conclusion, you don't need them both. Together they are stronger, but if you took either of them away, you'd still have an inductive argument. 
Okay, I think that you're ready to do a little diagramming, and we will do that at our next meeting. This is the end of the lecture on Chapter 2.